The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'm determined to tell you something about the convolution rule. I just uh, get close to it, but I haven't quite got there. And actually, uh, I, I'd like to say something also about why convolution is so important. Uh, this, I mentioned here a paper um, uh, about images in deep learning uh, by, it has three authors and these are two of them. Maybe you recognize Hinton's name. He's uh, originally English. He was in, in uh, San Diego for quite a few years and now he's in Canada. So Toronto and Montreal are big centers now for deep learning. Uh, so, and he's, he's really uh, one, of the, one of the leaders and, and so is Sutskever. So maybe you know that the, the sort of progress of deep learning uh, can, can often be measured in these competitions that are held like every, about every year for you know how how well how well does some people design and and execute a a, 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 a whole uh, neural net and uh, this was a competition about images so that is really demanding because as I said last time the, an image has so many samples so many pixels that uh, the computational problem is enormous, and that's when you would go to convolutional neural nets, CNN, because a convolutional net takes fewer weights because the same weight is appearing along diagonals. It doesn't need a full matrix of weights, just one top row of weights. Anyway, so this is one of the historical papers in the, in the, in the history of deep learning. I, I'll just read a couple of sentences. We trained, so this is the abstract. We trained a deep, a large deep convolutional neural network. I'll just inter, inter say that they, it took, it ran for five days on two GPUs. So it was an enormous problem as we'll see. So we trained a large deep net network, CNN, to classify 1.2 million high-res images in ImageNet. So ImageNet is a source of millions of images. And uh, on the test data, they, well, we, uh, the last sentence is maybe a key. We entered a variant of this model in the competition, 2012 competition, and we achieved a winning top five test error rate of 15% compared to 26% for, for the second place team. So 15% error they got, 26% was the best that the rest of the world did. And uh, so, so that, uh, and, and when he shows the network, you realize what's, what's gone into it. Uh, it has uh, convolution layers, and it has some normal layers, and it has uh, max pooling layers to cut the dimension down a little bit. And, uh, it's, and, and the, half the samples go on one GPU and half another, and at certain points, layers interconnect between the two GPUs. And so th to reduce overfitting, you remember that's the key problem is to reduce overfitting in this in the fully connected layers those are the ordinary layers with full weight matrices we employed a recently developed regularization called dropout so dropout is a tool which if you're in this world you you i think hinton proposed it again by seeing that it worked it's just a careful, it's a careful dropout of, of some of the data. It reduces the amount of data and it doesn't harm the, the uh, problem. So 
so the neural network has 60 million parameters, 60 million, with 650,000 neurons, five convolutional layers and three fully connected layers. I, I, I just mentioned this, and you could, if you just Google these two names, you would, on, on the web, you'd, that pa this paper would come up. Um, but it's, so it's, we're talking about the real thing here. Convolution is something everybody wants to understand. And I, I'd like to, since I've started several days ago, and I'd like to re remember what convolution means. Let me, so if I convolve two vectors, and I look for the case component of the answer, uh, the, the formula is I add up all the c's times d's, where the index i plus j adds to k. Why do you do such a thing? Because c might be represented by a, a polynomial, say x plus, plus c n x to the n. And d might be represented by another one, d1x plus dmx to the m, let's say. And convolution arises when I multiply those polynomials, because for a typical, and then collect terms, because a typical power of x, say x to the k, the coefficients are. Well, how do we get x to the k in, in multiplying these? I multiply c naught times a dk. Somewhere in here would be a dk x to the k. So a c naught times a dk would give me an x to the k term. And a c1 times, everybody sees this coming now? Uh, c1 has an x in it already. So over there, we would look at dk minus 1 with one less x, so it would be c1 dk minus 1. This is just what you do when you multiply polynomials. And the point is that the way we recognize those terms is that the exponents, 0 and k, the exponents 1 and k minus 1, always add to k. So that's where this formula comes from. We take a c times a d hiding behind our c x to the i and a dj x to the j. And when a pl i plus j is k, this is x to the k. And that's the term we're capturing. So this is the coefficient of that term. And let me write it in a slightly different way, where you actually see even more clearly convolution operating. So j is k minus i, right? So it's the sum of c i d j, but the j has to be k minus i. So this is the, this is the way to remember the formula for the coefficients in, the con in c star d in the convolution. You look at c's times d's. It's a, it's a form of multiplication. It comes from ordinary multiplication of polynomials. And when you collect terms, you're collecting c, the i c and the k minus i d, and you're taking all possible i's. So it's the sum over all possible i's there to give you the kth answer. Well, just to see if you got the idea, what would be the convolution of two functions? Suppose I have a function, f of x, and I want to convolve that with a function g of x. OK. And notice that I have not circled this symbol. So I'm not doing periodic convolution. I'm just doing straightforward convolution. So what are we going to have in the case of two functions. What would that mean, a convolution of functions? I'm, I'm in parallel here with a convolution of two vectors. So think of these now have become functions. 
the case component has become really, I should say, f star g at x. That's really, that's really the parallel to this. So let me. Uh, so I'm, I'm telling you the answer at x. Here I told you the answer at k. The case, the case component looks like that. What does the x value of the convolution look like for functions? OK, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do the same as this. Instead of summing, what will I do? Integrate. Instead of c sub i, I'll have f of x. i's, the index i is changing over to the continuous variable x. And now g, instead of dk minus i, what do I have here? So, so it's, a, it's the k minus i component. That will go to, let me just write it down, t minus x. So, so in, in this translation, f is being translated to c, uh, or sorry, f is, corresponds to c, g corresponds to d, k corresponds to x, and, oh no, sorry, i corresponds to x, and j, and, and uh, k minus i corresponds to t minus x. So, so k corresponds to t. That's the, this is, would, would be the convolution of two functions. Oh, it's a function of t. Bad, bad uh, notation. I have two, f it, the t is sort of the, sh the amount of shift, uh, you see, I've shifted g, I've, I've reversed it, in, or, or I've flipped it, and shifting it by different amounts t. It's, it's what you have in a filter. It's just all over, always present in, in, uh, in signal processing. So that, that would be a uh, definition. Or I could, if you like, I, if you want an x variable to come out, let me make an x variable come out by exchanging t and x. So, so this would be x minus t dt. I like that actually a little better. And the, it's the integral over t minus infinity to infinity if our functions were on the whole line. So that will there will be a convolution rule for that. The that this will connect to the Fourier transform of the two functions. Over here, I'm connecting it to the discrete Fourier transform of the two functions. And I've been making the convolution cyclic. So what does, can I add cyclic now? This is ordinary convolution. This is what you had in the first lab, I think, from, uh, from uh, Raj Rao. The first lab, you remember you had to figure out what the, uh, how many uh, components the convolution would have, and you didn't make it cyclic. So a cyclic uh, convolution, if, if this has n components and this has n components, then the convolution has n components. Because you have keeping, n is the key number there, the, 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 the length of the period. Uh, and similarly over here, if f is 2 pi periodic and g is 2 pi periodic, then we might want to do a periodic convolution and uh, bring it, get, a, get a, an answer that also has 2 pi, period 2 pi, yeah. So we, you could compute the convolution of sine x with cos x, for example. OK, let's stick with vectors. So, so what's the deal when I, make, when I uh, make it cyclic? When I make it cyclic, then in this multiplication, I really should use, I've introduced w as that 
uh, instead of x. So cyclic x becomes this, this number w, which is e to the 2 pi i over n, and has the property then that w to the nth is 1, so that all vectors of length greater than n can be folded back using this rule to a vector of length n. So we get a cyclic guy. So how does, how does that change the answer? Well, I only want k going from 0 to n minus 1 in the cyclic case. I, I don't want infinitely many components. I've got to bring them back again. And let me just say what uh, uh, the rule would be. You just ask, uh, uh, say, i plus j. You would look at that modulo n. That's, that's what a, a number theory person would call it. Uh, we only look at, at the remainder when we divide by n. So we, so now the the sums go only from zero to n minus one, and I only get an answer from zero to n minus one. Well, I've done that pretty quickly. Uh, that's if I wanted to do justice to. Uh, so it, the, it, the difference between non-periodic. So non-periodic and periodic will be the difference between, uh, so I have some number t0 on the diagonals, t1, t2, t minus 1, t minus 2, and so on, constant diagonals. So the key name there is tuplets. And if it's periodic, then I have, I'll say C, 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 and then the next one will be C1, C1 coming around to C1, and C2 coming around. So it's, so it's N by N, period N, so it's a, it's a circulant matrix, N by N. Okay, that's just the, that's the big picture. And I think in that first lab you were doing, you were asked to do the non-circulant case because that's the one where you have to do a little patience. What will be the length? Yeah, what, what would be the length of a, of a non-circulant, so not circulant now? Suppose C, suppose the C vector has uh, P components and the D vector has Q components how many components in their convolution? Shall I write that question down? Because that, that brings out the difference here. Yeah, so, so if I have P, if uh, C, has, C has P components, D has Q components, then the convolution of C and D has how many? So I'm multiplying. So it's really this corresponds to a polynomial of degree p minus 1, right? Polynomials of degree p minus 1. And this guy would be degree q minus 1, degree q minus 1. And when I multiply them, what's the degree? Just add. And how many coefficients? Well, one more I have to remember for that stupid uh, zero order term. So this would have p plus q minus 1 component. So that would have been the number that you somehow had to work out in, in that first lab. Uh, so that if this had n components and this had n, this would have 2n minus 1. It's just what you would have like. You say 3 plus x times 1 plus 2x. In this case, p is 2, q is 2, 2x 
two components, two components, and if I multiply those, I get 3x and 6x is 7x and, and 2x squared. And so I have uh, 2 plus 2 minus 1 equals 3 components. X, constant x and x squared. Yeah, clear. Right. Yeah, so that's not the... That's what I would get if I multiplied these matrices. Uh, if I had a two-diagonal matrix, triplets matrix, times a two-diagonal triplets matrix, that would give me a three-diagonal uh, answer. But if I am doing it periodically, I would only have two. Uh, that that two x squared would come back if if I come back as a a two, so I just have five plus seven x. Good, right, good, good, good. Okay, so that's a reminder of what convolution is, cyclic and non-cyclic, vectors and functions. Okay, then eigenvalues and eigenvectors are the next step, and then the convolution rule is the last step. So, eigenvectors. Eigenvectors of circular. Of course, I can only do square matrices, so so it's so I'm I'm doing the periodic case. So the eigenvectors are the the columns of the of the eigenvector matrix, and I'm going to call it F for Fourier. So F is the, the first eigenvector is all ones. The next eigenvector is the fourth root of one, then the square root of one, i six, i eight, i fourth, i six, and finally one i cubed, i six, i ninth. Okay, that's f. Those are the four eigenvectors of the permutation P and of any polynomial in P. So my circulant is, is some C naught I plus C1 P plus C2 P squared and C3 P cubed. Okay. And finally, this is like the step we've been almost ready to do but didn't quite do. What are the eigenvectors? What, what eigenvectors are its eigenvectors? So those are the eigenvectors of P. And now we have just a combination of P's. So I think the eigenvectors, I just multiply. I take that same combination of the, of the eigen Vectors. Yeah. Yeah. Does that does that look right? So sorry. It's I'm I'm sorry. It's eigenvectors. They're the columns of F. Uh, the question I meant to ask is what are its eigenvalues? That's the key question. What are, the, what are the eigenvalues? And I think that if I just multiply f times c, I get the eigenvalues of the matrix C. That's the beauty. That's the nice formula. Uh, if my matrix is just P alone, then this is 0, 1, 0, 0, and I get 1 i, i squared, i cubed. But if C is some other combination of the P's, then I take the same combination of the eigenvectors uh, 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 to, uh, to C. Yeah. Do you see it? So I, I'm claiming that I'll get the four eigenvalues of C from this multiplication. So. Of course, if C naught, if if there's only C naught, then uh, I only get C naught, C naught, C naught, C naught 
I get it's a repeat four times repeated. But if it's a if it's this combination, then that matrix multiplication takes the same combination of this is a combination of the eigenvectors, and and that gives us give, gives us the right thing. Okay. So that's now. I just have one more step for this convolution rule, and then I'm happy. Really, the convolution rule is stating what we. It's stating a, a, a relation between multiplication, which we saw here and the convolution, which we saw for the coefficients. So the convolution rule is a connection between multiplying and uh, con convolution. And, and so let me say what that convolution rule is, and let me write it correctly. So, so here I take a cyclic convolution. I'm dealing with square matrices. Everything is cyclic here. And then I get, I, if I multiply by f, what do I have now? What does that represent? This was c and d, and I convolved them. So I got a, another circulant matrix. So, so, so up here, the multiplication of, of matrices is c times d. I want to connect multiplying those matrices with convolving the Cs. I want to connect, make that connection, right? So, uh, and that connection is the convolution rule. Okay. So this would be the eigenvalues of CD. Let's just pause there. Why, why am I looking at the eigenvalues of CD? Because if I do that multiplication, I get another triplets matrix, C times D, and the polynomial, the coefficients associated on the diagonals of C times D are the coefficients of the convolution. So the, its diagonals, its diagonals, come from convolving C with D cyclically. OK. Now I want to find those same eigenvalues in a second way and match, and the equation will be the convolution rule. So how could I find the eigenvalues of CD? Well, amazingly, they are the eigenvalues of C times the eigenvalues of D. I'm going to test this rule on two by two so you'll see everything happening. So this is the main, this is the fact that I want to use. Because, yeah, because C and D commute, C and D commute, they have the same eigenvectors and then the eigenvalues just multiply. So I can multiply. I can get that in a second way by taking the eigenvalues of C and multiplying those by the eigenvalues of D. And I multiply component by component. I multiply the eigenvalue for the, for the all ones vector by the eigenvalue for the all ones vector. So I do a, do you know this MATLAB command? Component by component multiplication. This is it's an important one. There's a guy's name is also associated with that. So, so that's a vector. That's a vector. And what comes out of that operation? If I have a vector with three components, so n is three here, and I do point star or dot star, I'm not sure what people usually say 
component by component, a three component vector times a three component vector, I get a three component vector, just like that. Yeah, yeah. So this is the convolution rule. That's the convolution rule. And the proof is the fact that, eigen, that when matrices commute, the eigenvalues of the product are just these eigenvalues times these eigenvalues because they have the same, eigen, the eigenvectors are always the same here for all these cir circulants. So there's the convolution rule that I can convolve and then transform, or I can transform separately and then multiply. So I just maybe better write that, the convolution rule. Let's call it the C rule. Convolve, then transform by F, or uh, transform separately by F, and then, then multiply point-wise, uh, you know, element by element, yeah, component by component. Okay. Yeah, so that's the convolution rule. And why is it sort of, why is it so important? Because transforming by F, multiplying by the Fourier matrix is extremely fast by the FFT. So, so it's uh, useful because of the FFT the fast Fourier transform to multiply. Yeah. Or to transform, whichever you equal transform. Multiply by F. Transform. So it's it's the it's the exist, presence of the FFT that makes this it gives us really two different ways to do it. In fact, uh, which is the faster way? So we can produce the same uh, result this way or this way, and uh, if I don't count the cost of if the cost of multiplying by F is low, because I have the FFT, which would you do? Which would you do? So let let me just think aloud before we answer that question, and then we're we're good. So if I so my vectors have n components. So one way I can do is to do convolution. How many how many steps is that? If I take a vector with n components and I convolve with a vector with n components, how many little multiplications do I have to do? n squared, right? Because each of the c's has to multiply each of the d's. So that takes n squared, and Fourier is cheap. It's n log n, log to the base 2. So the left-hand side is effectively n cubed. What about this one? How many, op how many uh, to do these two guys? To find the uh, Fourier transform to multiply by the matrix F? OK, those are fast again. That's just, I've got two multiplications by F, so that's two n log n. And what's the cost of this? I have a vector with n components. 
dot star, a vector, another vector with n components. How many little multiplications do I have to do for a Hadamard product or a or a component by component product? N, only n. Plus n. Yeah, I should maybe I should have made that plus. Yeah, yeah. I had I had two. Uh, no, I had one n log n. Plus, it took n squared to find that vector, and then n log n. So it's the, so effectively n squared. But this one, where I do the n log n twice, and then I only it only takes me n more. So this is the fast way. So if you wanted to multiply two really big, long integers, as you would want to do in, in cryptography, if you had two long integers, say, of length 125, 126, 128, 128 components, uh, to multiply those, you would be better off to separately take the, the cyclic transform of each of those 128 guys and uh, do it this way. Take the, take the transforms, do the component by component product, and then transform back to get that. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, the convolution rule is what makes that go. OK. So that's, oh, one more thought, I guess, about all this convolution stuff. Suppose we're in 2D. We have to think, what's, what is a two-dimensional convolution? What does this become in two dimensions? Suppose we have functions. So now I'm, I'm going to do 2D functions of x and y, periodic or not periodic. But what will we, what's a convolution? What's the, operation we have to do in two dimensions. Well, it's a double integral, of course. t and u. We would do f of t and uh, u times g of x minus t, y minus u, d, t, d, u. And that would produce a function so I'm convolving a function of x and y with another function of x and y. And again, I'm looking for the, this, this, this is the key to watch for, x minus t, y minus u. That, that's the signal of a convolution integral. Yeah, so that, that's what we would have in 2D. In general, do you, so my... Maybe my, now my final thought is to move, to think about two-dimensional matrices and, and their products and so on. And this is why you need them, because you're, you, if, you're, if you have two-dimensional signals, then the, the components fit into a matrix. And uh, we just have to operate in both dimensions. So, so the... The key, the key uh, operation in 2D is in MATLAB, the MATLAB command that you need to know to get, if you know what you're doing in 1D and you want to do it in 2D, the MATLAB command is cron. So, so we, Imagine we have uh, one-dimensional matrices A and B. And so those are in 1D, and we want to produce the, a natural two-dimensional two matrix. So these will be N by N. And we want uh, the sort of natural product, let me call it K for cron, which will be n squared by n squared. I want to create a 2D matrix with connected to a, an image that's n in each direction. 
So it has, the, it has n squared pixels. This is, these are 1D signals, and K is a 2D one, and this K would be the, this is the operation to know. Given, given two one-dimensional n by n matrices, uh, Cron produces a two, uh, an n squared by n squared matrix. It's the, it's the operation to know. So I'll just write it, and if you know what Cron is, then you know what you know it before I write it. So what? So I want to produce a big matrix, n squared by n squared. somehow appropriately multiplying these two guys. And the appropriate way to do it is to take A11 and multiply by B. So there, what do I have, what size have I got there already just in that one corner? N by N, right? It's a number times an N by N matrix. Then A12 times B. That's another n by n matrix, up to a1n times b. So I have now, sorry, cap n. So I have cap n matrices in a row. Each of those matrices is n by n, so my, that row has length n squared. And of course, the next row is I've, I've allowed myself to number from 1 to n, but uh, very often that numbering should be 0 to n minus 1. And finally, on down here, down to a n 1 b to a n n b. So, so that's the n squared by n squared matrix that you would need to know. For example, if you wanted to do a two-dimensional Trans Fourier transform, it would be, uh, yeah, so what would a two-dimensional Fourier transform produce? What, what matrix? Is this the matrix you would use for, for a 2D? Uh, yeah, I'm, I've lost, I haven't sort of got started properly on 2D Fourier transform. So would it be F times F? F, the chronic, so let me write down the full name of this guy, chronicer. So it's called the chronicer product. It's just, it's just the right thing to know in moving from one dimension to two dimensions. For example, let me do, do an example. Oh, that's full. Have I got one board left? Yeah. Yeah. So here's a standard matrix. Call it A, twos, and minus ones. So that 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 cor that corresponds to a second derivative, or actually minus a second derivative. Now, suppose I have a ma another, the same matrix corresponding to second derivatives in the y direction. Same. So, and what I really want to do is both. I want to have my, a matrix K that corresponds to minus the second in the x direction minus the second in the y. So this is the Laplace, Laplacian, which is all over the place in differential equations. At a typical point, I want to do minus one of these, two of these, minus one of those in the x direction, and I want to add to that minus one. Now that two becomes a four, and minus one in the y direction. So I'm looking for the two by two, the, sorry, the, the two-dimensional matrix that takes, that does that five-point scheme, 
five weights for, uh, at each point. It takes four of the, on the diagonal and minus one on the four neighbors. And the operation that would do that would be, uh, you would use cron. It wouldn't be cron of a, b. That would, it just, k of a, b is not what I, what I, cron of a, b is not what I want. Yeah, that would do one and then the other one. And then that would probably produce nine non-zeros. I want something that adds here. So I, I, I want cron of a times the identity. That gives me the, the two-dimensional thing for this part. And then I'll add on cron of i b for the vertical derivative, the derivatives in the y direction. So that would be, uh, so that's called a Kronecker sum. This is a, this is a, the other was a Kronecker product. So that would be a Kronecker product. This would be another Kronecker product and the total is called the Kronecker sum. Okay. I wanted just to get that those notations out because really, you know, Fourier transforming is, uh, is such a central operation in, in, in all of applied math and especially in signal processing. Okay, so I'm good for today. Uh, let's see, I've got one volunteer so far for a, to talk about a project. Uh, can I encourage an email from anybody? It doesn't, you don't have to be a superstar. It's uh, just willing to to uh, do it. Uh, tell us something about what you've learned. Get comments from the audience, and you know, ten ten or fifteen minutes is all um, I'm thinking about. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you send me an email if you're if you'd like to tell us that and get some feedback. Okay. Good. So I'll see you Wednesday. Thanks.